How are y'all doing? Good, good, I'm glad. So, my name's Jerry. This is my first conference talk ever. Thanks. <laughs> I'm coming to you all the way from Oakland, uh, from a little company you may know as NPM. Uh, it might surprise you that I'm the only in-house designer at NPM. Uh, so how many of you here are designers or have a design background? Like 20? Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, that's not that many, but hopefully by the end of this, there will be more of you raising your hands because you'll be interested in UX design. Uh, as she may have mentioned, I have recently designed the NPM website this year. Hopefully, you're enjoying it. If not, feel free to tweet at me. Seriously, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> when I first joined NPM about two and a half years ago, it was uh, this red bar with this gray other bar, and it felt very oppressive to me. So I'm happy to have added some color and made it a little bit better for you all. So what I'm going to be talking about today is how to get your organization to prioritize user experience design. You may be at a place now where you don't have any UX designers, or you may be working your way through some tough problems and asking for one. Um, so when I talk about UX, what I'm talking about is the top of the stack. There really isn't a simpler model to describe this. You start with technology that's innovative, you add features, and eventually you need to differentiate yourself somehow. So you build a better experience to do that. Here's some of the topics I'm going to be touching on. Uh, if you want something to Google later, maybe write some of these down and do that. But at the very least, I'll give you an introduction. But I want to ask you a question first. Who actually does UX design? You think it's, raise your hand if you think it's the UX designer. All right, so you're partially right, but you're also partially wrong. Uh, but I'll answer it with another question. Who has an impact on the final product? And I would argue that it's pretty much everyone. If you're a developer, a designer, a support tech, a product manager, project manager, doesn't matter who you are. You're all building services and working on things that affect the user experience. So we might as well learn how to do it well, am I right? So the first step is to get a UX designer. <laughs> the idea is to work with someone who knows what good UX looks like, so you can actually replicate that later on. But let's take a step back and understand how organizations function without a UX designer and how they move into, say, maybe having 10 or 20 or 100 UX designers, where everyone is thinking about UX design. So I'm going to mention the five stages of UX design organizations. And this is something that comes from Jared Spool, who writes an article called Beyond the Tipping Point. Um, because when you proliferate, UX throughout your organization, you are basically going to have a better product. And you're already kind of doing it, so you might as well learn how to do it well. So we'll start from the beginning. The dark ages. There's no UX designer. There are no resources for design. And you may or may not have noticed this, but you're probably shipping features that are maybe a little annoying to use. Maybe there's something that could be better about it. But you're probably going to have someone in your org who's championing UX at this point. Maybe it's a developer. Maybe it's a PM. But someone is going to be saying, we actually need a designer. Can we please get a designer? <laughs> uh, and they're probably going to fail for a little bit. But it's good to have someone to champion this in your organization. So let's say they finally realize that you know, you've all been asking for UX, and they finally bring someone in. Maybe it's a contractor. Maybe they're not full time. But at least you have some resources. This is called spot UX design. Uh, you have occasional design projects that probably, maybe they fail. Maybe they're successful. I don't know. 
they usually end up going so-so because you have so few resources. But uh, hopefully, the person who championed UX doesn't end up leaving after this project, <laughs> which is unfortunately all too common. So we finally grow into some serious investment from the organization. We grow from zero people doing it to maybe you have some uh, engineering resources allocated to fixing UX problems. Maybe you have some projects. Maybe you even hire a designer. So when NPM hired me, this was really exciting because no one was doing it. Um, uh, and the end goal of this stage is to actually have uh, a UX team at some point that can serve projects on an as-needed basis. So design is no longer an afterthought. It no longer comes after you've started the feature, you've built it, and you've shipped it, and you're asking a designer to come on later and simply sprinkle on their expertise. So NPM isn't here yet. Um, project teams eventually can get their own UX resources and also work with other designers at the company across teams. This is where you start to get vision and roadmap and things that are coming from the UX team. Before this, you're really working with just one-offs, and you might not be moving as fast as you'd like. Eventually, organizations add designers with different skill sets, and you start shipping less crappy work. You start being less able to let something into the world that isn't fully fleshed out. So Jared Spool says this, with more investment that shows up as more UX skills are added to teams, the tolerance for compromising on design reduces. Eventually, a compromised design is more of an exception than a common occurrence. But finally, what I'm here to talk to you all about is the end goal. You're all doing it anyway, so we might as well do it well. Infused UX design. This is when everyone understands good design because you have designers proliferated throughout the company. And the difference is that the non-designer team members are now fluent in design because they've learned how to do it through practice and through working with their colleagues. Product teams are working together to provide a seamless experience across teams. And I'm sorry to say that few companies get to this, but the ones that do are really, really, really good. Poof, you're now a UX designer. <laughs> uh, I don't care if you can use uh, application to design or if you sketch on a napkin or if you use an app called Sketch. It's all the same. It all comes down to thinking about the user and thinking about how they engage with your product. So. Now you can enjoy a nice cup of UX tea. <laughs> but Jerry, why should we be thinking about this UX design stuff if we're getting mock-ups from our designer? Well, you should still think about it. And you should think about these things that I'm about to mention in the next slide. But my favorite request is, hey, Jerry, we just need wireframes. We don't need research. We don't need interviews. <laughs> We don't need anything else. Just give us the mocks, and we'll be fine. And my answer to that is, hell no. <laughs> it's going to be really shitty. <laughs> but we're not going for perfection either, right? Users, I actually care about you. NPM loves you, but I actually care about you. <laughs> because the code that you write affects users in the end. So if your code touches the product in any way, which I'm guessing it does, you're already doing user experience design. But I challenge you to do it better. All problems can be boiled down to people problems. We call the people who interact with our product users, as you all know. But we do this so that we think of them as separate from ourselves, as people who have problems, and we want to solve their problems. This is what happens when we don't care. <laughs> we build features, we build technology, we glue them together, and they look like shit. 
and no one wants to use them. <laughs> so this is why we think about experience. Context. Users bring baggage with them, real-life baggage. They have social problems. They have you know, things that are different about them. Maybe, they're, you know, maybe your product is an ATM, and they're on a rush, and they don't have time to figure your weird UI out. And speaking of ATMs, when I landed in Barcelona, I tried to get some money out, and this is what I saw. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Why would I recharge my phone? <laughs> like, there's a line of people behind me, y'all. I'm not going to stand there and charge my phone. Also, who thought of this? <laughs> this is really bad UX. It's not a bug. It's bad UX. It's a bug, too. <laughs> so the ultimate goal of UX design is engagement. If your product isn't engaging users in a way that leaves them feeling fine or maybe even good, then you probably have some work to do. If you're getting a compliment on your product, then you probably have an excellent user experience. So, does this look familiar to anyone? <laughs> Here's another example. I've literally been using showers my whole life, and I couldn't figure out how to use this one. <laughs> so context really matters. I know how to use a shower. Maybe do some research. <laughs> constraints. And I'm not talking about technical constraints. I'm talking about limitations that users have. Some people are disabled. Some people are in another country where their internet connection is not very good. And some people just have a crappy computer. So on NPM's website, we disable, you can disable JavaScript and have a totally fine experience. And we don't make use of crazy animations because we know that it's going to slow your computer down. If you want to see this in action, try loading a marketing page with Parallax and use an old computer and see what I mean. How about some tips, Jerry? Can I have tips? I can, ha I can give you tips, yes. You can have it. So when I said think and write about design, I didn't mean sit down and write a book <laughs> or write a blog post. I meant maybe write something like job stories. Job stories are like user stories. Intercom writes about them, but they come with less assumptions. They're about solving a problem. If you can write this about the thing that you're asked to work on from a user's perspective, then you could probably get a lot further and build something that's actually usable in the end. Why do people hire your product? They don't hire us as developers and designers. They hire your product. So give them something worth using. Because in the end, all they care about is the, the part that they see. The rest is just magic. This is about getting solid knowledge of where the user is coming from and where they're going. It's as simple as that. So when I'm standing at an ATM in Barcelona, and I want to change the language to English, I do so so that I can take money out of the ATM, and I can get out of the line so someone else can get money. <laughs> so luckily, most ATMs do this. Look for precedents. I'll try to change the word. Maybe patterns works better. If you're trying to solve a problem for a user, look at how other companies are solving it first. It's really simple. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, find and replace is a pretty good example of this. Find and replace is, is very similar on every computer, on every you know, if you have a keyboard and mouse, find and replace should be pretty straightforward. If you're using a crappy find and replace, then they've got a problem. <laughs> so looking at precedents means looking at patterns of how the problem has been solved before. It doesn't even have to be in your domain. If you're all thinking about 
UX design and users, then if your users have a painful problem, you probably want to solve that first. The idea is to be in an org where you're free to solve those problems and not just the big thing that's being prioritized. You're free to clear pain points away for users. And some really obvious things, like using a style guide. This is something that's helped NPM immensely. We didn't always have one, but now that we do, it's really easy for developers to put together pages and flows without having to have one designer constantly present. So it reduces the chance of shipping bad design. If you don't have one, you probably have tons of UI anyway, and you can start making one. So I challenge you to do that if you haven't done it already. But this is all about user-centered design. So if that's something you're interested in, I also challenge you to go out and learn more about it. Because in the end, it's people who are using our products, and we want their experience to be seamless so that we can keep our jobs. <laughs> and also because it's the right thing to do. So I'm not asking you to do more work. I'm simply asking you to maybe time box yourself and do some of the things here, because perfect is the enemy of done. Design activities are just another way to think. They give you another way to look at the problem that you're solving. So don't spend all your time trying to get it perfect. But just because we can't make it perfect doesn't mean we can't strive for excellence. Thank you. <laughs>